Right, let's finish Bemele's route, shall we? We cross a long path and come across a strange sight. It's a bridge which curves in and becomes more narrow in the middle than usual. Eyeing the dubious bridge warily, I grow nervous at the idea of getting that close to the edge. Let me bring up the guide again because I've still got um two more choices to make. Sorry, I hit the I hit the mic. Bemele's pace slows before coming to a stop directly in front of the foreign way. For once, he looks to the guide for this matter. The guide appraises the bridge, looking intensely down the path ahead. Normally, it would be possible to cross a narrow bridge if one is careful with how they step. We can't continue as we are. Our combined weight is too much. Is there another path? This is our path. Bemele's eyes widen at the explanation before gritting his teeth and speaking with a tone coated with suspicion. So, you knew from the start we'd reach a point where putting you down was the only option. The guide's silence is confirmation enough for Bemele. He scoffs derivatively, derisively, one of those, then purposefully strides forward, placing, planting his feet on the mouth of the narrowed bridge. I'm far too fucking tired, man. I'm far too tired. I always push it one too far. I swear, I always do that. I always push it one too far. Then prepare to cross it with me. The guide still does not speak. He looks completely unfettered. Emily doesn't take kindly to the guide's dismissiveness. He lifts his boot for a second time, stretching it out ahead of his body and threatening to move even further down the narrow way. Emily is bluffing. Even he isn't reckless enough to cross that bridge holding another person. But I can see why he'd go this far. The guide will not open up easily. I know without a doubt, Bemele will be careful and he won't waste this opportunity to find a better way for all of us. I need to do what I can to make certain the guy doesn't call his bluff. Please. You have to try to think of another way. There are so many branches. At least one other must be able to take us to the shore. I worry the worst will occur if this continues. The guide waits an agonizing moment more. There is another path. It is longer, however, and prowlers are a far more common sight. Emily immediately lets out a bark of laughter. He is feeling awfully validated in this moment. It seems the guide had intended to keep information from us, if he could get away with it. I shake my head at the guide's warning. We can't allow him to move freely now, not after learning that. It will still be more manageable than this bridge. Margaret stares on as though she can hardly believe what's happening before her. Still, she remains quiet. Despite the guide's initial opinion, he sighs. Go back a small ways. You will find a branch heading west. Take it. With a satisfied grin, Bemele readjusts the guide on his shoulders and moves to be the head of the party again, leading the way back. We trek through where we came. Along the way, Bemele tries to make light conversation. He's recounting the battles in which I am my title. The guide has his focus elsewhere. It is doubtful he is hearing a word, Bemele says. Margaret seems engaged by the tale, at the very least. As he ends the story, he turns to me and smiles brightly. Because of Kika's status, she has the option to choose which missions to take rather than have to do whatever she is told. Despite that, she accepts each task assigned to her. Our entire village is awfully proud to have her. Oh, sorry, I need to yawn. I smile lightly at the excessive praise Bemele is happy to put on me. You are always so much too kind. Every guard does what's asked of them. I am no different from them, or you for that matter. Emily chuckles airily at my words. If there was nothing to admire about you, then I wouldn't do so. But the more I learn of who you are, the more I know for certain that I'm right about what I say. I feel myself fluster a bit under all the flattery. Emily has always had a natural camaraderie with the guards. Only now have I started to realize he has made an effort to be extra kind to me all this time. I look back at him I look back at him now spinning another riveting tale about my heroics, and I'm struck by how much of a thoughtful man Bemele is. He seems completely dedicated to making sure I'm surrounded by pleasance, even in dark times such as these. Later on our path, weaving through the labyrinth of boards, Bemele becomes uncharacteristically quiet. I look over to see that his breathing is heavy. Carrying the guide is starting to take its toll. I feel the urge to say something, however I bite my tongue. That would only give the guide a reason to demand his medicine, and that's a situation neither Bemele or I want. 
I'm watching as Bemele's knees suddenly lock up and he nearly stumbles forward. He catches himself and manages to stay on two feet, yet the guide starts to slip from his grasp. Bemele tightens his grip and hoists him back hoists him back up all the way onto his shoulders. The guide's face twists into a grimace at being jostled. Bemele attempts to mask his fumble with a laugh. I hope you aren't falling asleep up there. You've got to stay on your toes, even if you aren't walking on them. You're leading the way. The guide scrunches his nose in another display of pain, or perhaps annoyance. Why are you so eager to die? I'm not sure where you got an idea like that from. I've already explained that I'm doing this precisely so we won't die. Preventing you from leaving us to those monsters is worth a little added weight. The guy clicks his tongue and sneers at Bemily. Letting me lead uninterrupted means there was a chance I could leave you behind, yes. However, that was a moderate risk compared to the enormous one you are taking right now by carrying another person. It is not you who benefited from this. Emily quirks an eyebrow at the guide. The risk was lowered then. Good to have a confirmation on that. The lull in the conversation as the guide quiets. He adds one more thought. I must assume he intends it to be his last contribution to this argument. A heroic end isn't something to strive for. It is a waste. Bemele shakes his head firmly. There have to be those who are willing to work for more than themselves. If there aren't, then it won't be possible to build something greater than just a single person. I always believed that I had no choice but to look at the world like the guide. However, I began to wonder, I begin to wonder if perhaps I don't. Pragmatism isn't the only method that holds worth. After that exchange, the mood darkens. There is a definite shift between Bemele and the guide. Though before it can escalate further, that distinct clicking noise becomes eerily apparent. I stiffen immediately and search around wildly with my eyes. Margaret also slows to listen nervously. The sound creeps down one of the branches of bridge connected to our set of boards. Despite how tired he must feel, Bemele hastily quickens his pace. The rest of us follow. After some time, we break away from the noise of the nearest prowler. Before we can relax that erratic... Before we can relax that, relax that erratic clicking, the squelching sound coils forth yet again from ahead of us. We continue to push forward, however no matter how fast we move or what bridges we take, we can't seem to escape the stalking sounds of these prowlers. Every so often I turn my head to look behind us to see if there's anything. Sometimes it does seem as though a crooked shadow is following us, and others it doesn't appear as though there's anything at all. Go down that path. The guide points feebly towards another branch with a hand that's even paler than usual. Bemele nods and walks down the crossroad chosen by the guide. He has been giving directions more frequently and Bemele is following them without hesitation. The prowlers grow louder and now in addition to the squishing sounds, chattering in the lake begins to bubble up. It's beginning to feel as though we're completely surrounded. Tensions are high and the situation is growing hectic. Margaret becomes more frantic with each step. Bemele is having troubles keeping collected, and I am trying to see everywhere at once as the sounds of the Nixie rising from the lake swiftly surrounds us. Eventually, regardless of his best efforts, Bemele has to stop to catch his breath. He inhales heavily, heaving gasp after gasp as sweat drips down from his forehead. We stay here. We'll be trapped by prowlers. Through ragged breaths, Bemele quips back at the guide. Once you've lost the ability to give directions, that's not going to happen. He starts to trudge on the path again with heavy, hard-hitting steps. Margaret looks at Bemele with concern, bringing her hands towards him half-heartedly as she debates over how to help. I debate with myself over whether I should say something or not. I could help, but that might be better saved for when we're out of such a dicey situation. We don't have any time to waste here. Let me carry him. You can hold on to my lantern and I will take the guy. I can't manage for as long as you have, however... That would be better than pushing yourself to the limit. Another yawn, sorry. I give him a withering look. Bemele returns my gaze, clearly conflict conflicted. After a moment, he releases a sigh. Bemele knows that the weight of this task isn't his alone. He cracks a small smile at me. I would appreciate that. The two of us make for a much better pair than he and I. Does our guide agree with that assessment? The guide gives us no answer and simply turns away. I smile awkwardly back at the both of them. 
Bemele places our injured lead down. I walk closer and offer my lantern to Bemele. He puts his hand over mine instead. It rests there, top of a pile with myself and the lantern handle underneath momentarily. I don't understand that sentence. I was wondering if I'm just tired, though. His fingers are trembling. After that brief gesture of affection, he takes the lantern with care. He then backs up with an encouraging grin on his face. I move to the guide and nod at him. I will help you now. The guide doesn't resist and makes no complaints over the switch. He accepts his fate as an inev inevitability. I pull on the man's lanky limbs to hoist him up onto my shoulders. The guide makes a few murmuring sounds of discomfort that quickly passes as he settles again. I can see Bemele is already breathing easier now that the load has been taking off his back. We need to get out of here. There is no disagreement with each of us being likewise eager to leave this place. There are still swarms of prowlers all over. The guide points an arm over my shoulder. Turn down that branch. We walk at a brisk pace down a new bridge. After what feels like an endless creeping nightmare, the light grows quiet again. We are finally left alone once more. Our group stops to breathe, still reeling from how close we came to the edge. As if to mock our attempts to feel calm, the light of the sun starts to peek through the mist. We're running out of time. It shakes me to think this coming light is the true reason we, are, we were freed from the prowlers. I steal myself for the answer to the question I'm about to ask. Is the shore close? We will have to run. I swallow down my dry throat. The weight of the guide feels that much more overwhelming now. We were still ragged with exhaustion from the trial we only just survived. However, I stand firm to address them. I will not let anything drag us down. We're almost there. We are going to make it. Emily smiles boldly at my words. Margaret nods a little shakily, yet she also seems determined not to, to not be left behind. I readjust the guide and tighten my grip on him. Then I begin to sprint down the bridge. As we run down a long stretch, the faint silhouette of land comes into view. I nearly can't believe it, that it's there when I see it. I ignore the pounding, aching feeling in my legs and pump them as hard as I can, focusing on the clear goal in the distance. We race against time as the sun rises even higher. Nearly all of the darkness has faded away. Even so, we don't stop. We keep pushing. The guide abruptly demands a change in direction. I start to take a sharp turn to the left when the added weight of his body causes me to tilt. Balance. <laughs> I halt my steps and manage to keep myself from wobbling too much. Emily appears right at my side. His face is full of fear. I can't blame him. That was a far closer call than I would have liked. A fragile smile breaks out past all the concern. He addresses the guide, who is still stubbornly clinging to my back. We're close enough to the end, I think. If Kika gives the medicine back, would you be able to manage the rest of the walk on your own? There isn't time for it to take effect. I try to steady my shaking legs. I've carried him far longer than I've ever needed to lift another person before, but it has to be done. We can't leave him here. Hmm. Well then, might I help you with that dead weight? I'll take one arm, and you can keep the other. I lift up my eyes to meet his. They shine confidently. Bemele is a good man. Involving another person may be quite a risk, yet at this point I feel like it will be worth it. Between the two of us, we should have the strength to go on. Yes. Thank you. I slide the guide down one side to make it easier for Bemele to take hold. He takes position as the final part of, the, of, of a chain connecting all three of us. The guy's only contribution is a nearly inaudible sigh I only catch because his face is so close to my ear. Bemele and I nod knowingly at one another, then we begin to run, fighting against the sunrise and our own exhaustion. The three on our feet continue running as hard as we can until the dock draws near. And we finally make it to the shore. <gasps> I nearly vault my body as far away from the shoreline as possible before completely collapsing onto the sand. The guide lets loose a deeply pained groan as he ends up being brought to the ground with me. He still takes the opportunity to gracelessly untangle himself from my hold. When I regain even the smallest modicum of strength, I dive my hand into one of my pouches and fetch the medicine we took from him. I offer the vial to the guide. He stares at it for a moment, and then at me. He silently accepts it. I look at him with my thoughts mixed. Should I apologize? Even if this part of the journey was- uh, even if this part of the journey everyone was spared, the guide still suffered from our actions. While I ponder over what to do, the guide doesn't show the same lack of surety. He disregards my glances and da downs the vial completely. His eyes slam closed. Anything said to him would be unwanted, regardless of what it was, that much is clear. 
Assuming that he would prefer to finally have his own space returned, I push myself away, my joints creak, still burning from how much exertion they were forced to endure moments ago. The events that just unfolded flash before me. Suddenly, I feel myself being the one lifted. It's Bemele who holds me close to his chest. I hear him quietly sniffling above me. I just got an achievement called Loyalty. Uh, I relax into Bemele's embrace while wrapping my arms around his neck. Hot tears brim in the corner of my eyes and I allow them to fall freely. Through this great emotion he speaks quietly, more to himself than anyone else. Thank God. The small statement makes it fully sink in that we reached the shore. We actually made it after everything. We're safe. I'm so overjoyed that he is here, that the both of us made it together. We stay like this as long as his worn state can manage. Even after placing me down, he never strays far. There is movement from the corner of my eye, and I notice that the guide is standing again. It is almost strange to see him behaving so normally, so distantly, after what we went through. He draws near to, her, to us, his cloak swaying in the morning wind with each step he takes. It is time to leave this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Upon being addressed by him, I rise to my feet. He has a calm look on his face, though there is force behind his serenity. I, I, I don't think I can skip. I open my mouth in an attempt to speak, however I quickly realize I still have little idea of what to say. He is untrustworthy, but in the end we were only able to cross because of him. And then the fog is removed from my thoughts. After everything that has happened, it becomes clear. I harden my face to match his serious disposition. There is something he is certainly right of. This lake isn't a place to linger. You know what? Nope, I can't skip. What I must do if I truly want to defend others is to keep them from coming here at all. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goodbye. His eyes narrow. Burr notices him smile a bit, and then he leaves. Emily smirks lightly to himself, refusing to truly acknowledge the guide. I make no complaints. This is likely for the best. Margaret steps over to us and regards the guide with a pointed expression. This will be goodbye for us as well. I appreciate. The guide offers no reaction to her statement. In fact, he says nothing at all. Yep, bye. We make no attempt to stop him, watching him silently as he disappears into the landscape. It is painfully clear that no matter how meaningful this is for us, it is only another day in his life. This all seems so terribly sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to put all of this behind us. Especially not right at this moment. I stare at him silently, tongue-tied at his words. He gives me a comforting smile. The smile lingers for a bit before his expression promptly hardens. I'm not sure I'm the same coming off the bridges as I was stepping onto them. It's something I'll always have to live with. That's all right, isn't it? I stare at him tenderly. Yes, it is. This won't be the last time we face situations where lives are on the line. I understand the difficult decisions will need to be made. Still, I am not going to let anyone abandon someone else, if I can help it. I can always look for another way. After all, it's impossible that I could ever be the most logical person in the room. Someone else will stop too much recklessness from happening. And then, occasionally, my focus on finding a solution to help all instead of accepting a painful reality will make a difference. I feel tears incoming and manage a smile for him, heartbroken and joyful. I think that's wonderful. I'm very much like you. He smiles happily, though then takes on a bashful look. Let me add that I don't want you to feel as though you personally need to make up for my ideals. I'm not your responsibility, and I'd like for you to be happy and honest about how you feel, and... He, st he started rambling, so I cut him off before he can work himself up further. Bermele? You have never been my responsibility. You're my partner. And you don't have to worry about me either. I understand. As a pair, I take pride in how one is strong where the other is weak. Emily's eyes grow wet with tears of his own, and he grins ear to ear. Kika, thank you. So tired. <laughs> thank you too. Look, lads, stop dragging this out, all right? He wipes his damp eyes on his sleeve and chuckles self-consciously. I hope that this means I'll be allowed to keep sharing your company from now on. It seems I've gotten used to seeing you each day. I would love nothing more. A warm sensation hovers between us. 
It means so much that we found what we each were missing in one another. It truly is time for us to leave you. this place. Emily stands a little taller. That is music to my ears. We turn around and walk away from the lake. Margaret notices and follows behind with no hesitation. I offer her a small smile, seeing her settle in step with me. Without looking back or stopping, I close my eyes and whisper, yeah, yeah, about our life. Oh, thank fuck for that. Okay, Bemele was a great help, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, we already know this. We already know all of this. Uh... After we returned home, Bemele adopted a wolf dog named Dedrick. He did not enjoy being alone at night so soon after what we witnessed on, on Sinlos. I could understand how he felt. I told him that I am there at any time if needed. Now, he along with Dedrick regularly make themselves at home in my cabin. I would be lying if I said it did not bring me comfort having him here. We still spar together and are often partnered for missions, meaning we spend most days together. It is incredible to still find fulfillment in these small joys, despite the pain and hardship. I will continue to do all I can to protect others as well as the life I've come to love. Apparently I got an achievement pain after that one? Why? Why did I get the pain achievement? What does that even mean? Oh, persevered through all the hurt. I could have got that on the first playthrough, but I didn't. So I'm very confused why I didn't get that one when it says I could get that one then. I don't know. Anyway, um... Wait, the first playthrough, there's more for me to... Okay, fair enough. Okay, well, for now... This is going to be a shorter one than usual because I'm not continuing more today. I will continue more another time. But yeah, I will see you in the next video regardless. Bye.